So this event is really special to me because we've brought two people I've known for almost all my life from the uh, Inuit community in Ottawa. So they've uh, driven up from Ottawa to be here. Um, so I'm excited to introduce them. This event is part of Indigenous Awareness Weeks. It's also part of an Inuit event series going on at McGill through the months of September and October called Ayuinata at McGill. So we have lots going on. Um, so I'm just excited that you're here. This is a unique event since it's not you know, a lecture or um, a, a traditional presentation. It's gonna be very active and fun. Um, so I'll introduce Ala, who's um, Enoch from Nunatsiavut, and his son Damien, um, who's in grade 12, and is also Enoch from Nunatsiavut. And Nunu. Oh, and Nunu. Yeah, true. Awesome. Mm -hmm. So I'll let you take it away. I won't say much more. Awesome. Thanks for having us. So good afternoon, everybody. So in Inuktitut, my name is Arla, and in English, that means stranger. I also don't have a last name anymore, so there's no need to call me Mr. or Sir. You just <laughs> call me stranger, because that's what it says on my knuckles. <laughs> right? And it's honestly what my name is. Um, and I no longer have a last name, and that's thanks to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, um, where people who had survived residential schools were able to tell their truth for the first time. And, and after months and months of hearing many, many different stories, um, a bunch of policymakers got together and they came up with 96 calls to action that different businesses and governments could, could take in order to help further along reconciliation. It's been seven years since the TRC. Out of 96 calls to action, guess how many have been implemented by the Canadian government? Eight. Yeah. Seven years, eight have been implemented out of 96. And one of them was allowing us to change our names for free. So I was able to apply. Um, so my name used to be from birth. It was Dion William Ephraim Metcalf. I was also baptized under that name. Not that I wanted to be. It just happened when I was a kid, right? So. I was really thankful that I was able to change my name um, to something um, that was more cultural and, and traditional because Inuit never had last names before Canada um, forced us to. So it was pretty funny. I actually had to go and get a signature from your mom to to say that Inuit never had last names before <laughs> so yeah um so that's that's nice that i was able to do that right and in ontario it usually is 137 dollars plus hst to change your name um but i got to do it for free and drop my last name so it's pretty cool um it causes some problems because like everything's online and if you know anything about filling out forms, there's masks, right? And like sometimes in like the last name, you can't put a space because I like to write, I don't have one. <laughs> <laughs> so sometimes they don't even like the, the punctuation in there. And so sometimes I just have to write my first name twice. Uh, my bank had to put my last name as two dots. And then like I do presentations and people write a check to me as stranger. And I'm like, um, <laughs> how am I gonna explain this one to my bank? <laughs> so I went in and I talked to the teller and I'm like, look, my name is Arla and in English it means stranger and like it's right here on my knuckles. And he's like, yeah, dude, don't worry about it. There's a section where you can put also known as and they wrote in stranger. So now I can legally cash checks made out to stranger. And I think that's pretty cool. So I am an Inuk who comes from Nunatsiavut, as Anika said. And does anybody have any clue what that means in English? Yeah. How many of you have heard the word Inuit before? Yeah, and how many of you know what that means in English? Kind of, you want to guess? Yeah, people. 
right? So if I tell you I'm not Inuit, I'm an Inuk, what do you think Inuk means? I'm not people. I'm one person, right? So Inuk, for one Inuit person. Inuk, I-N-U-U-K, for two Inuit people. And Inuit, for three or more, right? In our language, we have single, double, and then multiple. So that was, that's the way it works. And what's really cool is, like, we don't have exceptions to our rules because our language is our language, right? It's existed since the dawn of time, unlike English, and which is made up of, like, every other language in the world. And that's why you can say, like, the dog he had 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 fleas. And, and like, I before E except after C, but what about my weird neighbor Keith, right? So we don't, like, those exceptions don't happen in our, in our language because it's its own, its own language, right? So now that word Nunatsiavut, well, that's a part of Canada. But you guys wouldn't know it by its English name. You would, or not, <laughs> I get my words mixed up sometimes. You guys wouldn't know it by its Inuktitut name. You would know it by its English name. So what part of Canada do you think I come from? Nunavut is an Inuktitut word, which means our land. And Nunatsiavut is an Inuktitut word, which means our beautiful land. And we had to do them one better. <laughs> <laughs> so we're from a different part of Canada. So what other parts of Canada do you think are in the Arctic? There's three territories and two provinces. Yeah, but now instead of going west, go east. Quebec? Go further east. Labrador? Yeah. So that's where my family comes from, is Labrador. But we don't call it Labrador. We call it Nunatsiavu, right? Um, and then northern Quebec, we call that Nunavik. And it also means our land, but in the northern Quebec dialect, Nunavut also means our land, but in the Baffin Island dialect. And then the northern parts of the Northwest Territories in the Yukon, we call that Inuvialuit, a place where Inuit come from, right? And then Inuit also live in Alaska, which is part of the United States. So we live in Siberia, which is part of Russia. And we live in Greenland, which is part of Denmark. So Inuit, we occupy the circumpolar region. We like to live where it's nice and cold. <laughs> we like the cold, right? Like we've been waiting for this weather since like May. I'm, I'm actually waiting for it to get colder. Yeah. I, I stay in shorts until about minus 15, minus 20. Yep. And then he'll throw on a pair of pants. Over his shorts, so that when he gets to school, he can take his pants off. And then he sits in class just like this while everybody else is freezing cold. I used to get a lot of phone calls from, from teachers in elementary school, right? Like, excuse me, like, you want to, like, send some proper clothing for your kid? I'm like, what are you talking about? And they're like, your kid's sitting in my class in shorts and a tank top, and it's minus 20 outside. I'm like, yeah, is he sweating? And, and you could hear them think, right? And, and they'd be like, no, he's not sweating. I'm like, is he paying attention? And again, you could hear them think, and they're like, you know what? Damien actually is paying attention for once. I'm like, yeah, because he's properly dressed for him, right? Most schools in Ottawa are set at 21, 22 degrees. He sits there, he'll dress like, if he was dressed like, mo like he'd just be sweating, right? So he dresses so that he's comfortable. Um, I haven't bought him a winter jacket in a decade, and he's 17. So I haven't bought him one since he was seven. There's just no point, because he won't wear it, right? If he gets that cold, he'll just throw on a second sweater, and he's good to go. Um, and that's because where most of us come from, it gets to like minus 40 uh, on a regular basis. And like, when you live in that, your body, changes right so we have less nerve endings than you guys do 
Inuit don't feel the same pain because we live where it's like minus 40 on a regular basis. You don't want to feel that. <laughs> so our bodies have just adapted over time, right? Our stomach enzymes are also different than yours because like for like the longest time, Inuit solely existed on the consumption of souls, right? We, we live in an environment where there are no trees, where there's snow on the ground eight months out of the year, where the ground is permanently frozen. So it's not like you're growing a bunch of apples or a bunch of oranges, right? So in a world without trees, where do you get your vitamins from? Animals, but we don't cook them. Right? You cook the meat, what happens to the meat? All the nutrients leave, right? In a world where the sun disappears for two and a half months, it, it's gone. For two, like it's dark for two and a half months. Where do you get your vitamin D from? Whale. Right? Eating frozen whale over the winter and seal gave us that vitamin D that we were missing from the sun. And then even today, like up north in the summertime, the sun's up for a month and a half. Like it's a day for a month and a half, right? So during the summer, when that sun's up 24 hours a day, kids are outside and it could be like 3 o'clock in the morning. And you have a group of kids at the play structure playing. And kids stay up for like 40 hours and then they sleep for 12 and then they're up for 36 and then they sleep for 20 and then there's no schedule, right? <laughs> but up north, like as, as, as if the sun's out, then the kids can be outside playing as much as they want because they need that, that, that vitamin D, right? It helps regulate your mood. Um, it helps, helps, you, helps make you happy, right? Um, so we eat whale, three different kinds of whale. We eat beluga, bowhead, and narwhal. That thing that sticks out of a narwhal, what is it? No, it's a tooth. So it's a tusk, right? A lot of people think it's a horn because it grows through their upper lip. And it's not like our teeth that grow in your mouth. It grows out their upper lip and, and out. So a lot of people think it's a horn. But most narwhal have it grow out the left side. Some narwhal have it grow out the right side. And very, very rarely. Yeah. Wasn't and it's really neat. They kind of twist. Sometimes they twist around each other. Yeah. Wasn't there a hunter who... Yeah, there is uh, somebody in the Ottawa community, their brother when he's out hunting narwhal, has only ever caught double tusk narwhal. That's very rare, very, very rare. So it's pretty cool. Um, we also still hunt and eat polar bear to this day. Um, if you look down at the ground and then you look up at that concrete, uh, now you know how tall a polar bear is when it's, still, well, maybe not that tall. That's about 12 feet. A polar bear is 10 feet tall when it stands on its back two legs. So about to the vent. Yeah. Yeah. Now, do you guys remember like in this area three years ago, Halloween got postponed by one day because of wind and rain, right? Well, that exact same year up in RV at Nunavut, trick-or-treating got changed from door to door to inside the school's gymnasium because 10 polar bears surrounded the town to hunt the kids. That's how smart polar bears are. They know on October 31st, those kids in our Viet go trick-or-treating. So they come, and they don't flank the town. They don't come from one side. They don't come from the ocean. They surround the town. So up north in every community, there's volunteers called Bear Patrol. And they just drive around in their cars with guns in their car and they just watch out for bears. Right? And that's all they do. Because like most animals, when they smell humans, what do they do? 
They go, they go and hide or they go the other direction. When polar bears smell humans, they come too. They're going to come eat. They're going to come eat us. Yeah, we're a nice juicy snack to them, right? Um, especially now with, with southern food going up north, now there's a lot of food wastage. And where does that food wastage end up? At the dump. So where do the polar bears end up? At the dump. Now in Ottawa, we have waste management. I don't know who does it here in Montreal, but we have waste management. They come around once a week, pick up your garbage or your recycling. Up north, in the community of 500 people, there's no waste management. You have to pile your garbage into your vehicle, drive down to the dump, and unload your vehicle while your buddy's standing there with his gun aim, aimed at the closest polar bear, right? So like something as simple as taking out the garbage is like a life or death situation, right? And anytime you step outside up north, that's just the way it is. Um, you can go on YouTube and you can find videos. There's one video, can't remember what community is, it is, but it's dark. Don't know if it's night, you know it's dark. <laughs> and, and, and Buddy pulls up in his van and he gets out and he crosses the street. And up north you have to climb up steps to get into every building because they're built on stilts, right? So he climbs up the stairs, goes into the, the corner store, buys what he wants to buy and he comes down the stairs, gets into his van and he pulls out backwards and then goes. And just as he's pulling forward, and a, a, a nine-foot polar bear comes out of the shadows. If Buddy had been like 10 seconds later, it, yeah, it would have been an encounter. Uh, but it happens all the time up north. Now, the polar bear scared of one animal. Which one? Walrus. Because it's bigger. Yeah, a full-grown bull walrus is bigger than a polar bear. Um, people don't realize how big these animals are because when you see them on TV or in magazines, what's not in the background? There's one thing missing. A person? No. <laughs> Trees. Hu human beings instinctively use trees to judge size and distance, right? So in a world without trees, how do you judge size and distance? Oh yeah, you can. There's a way. You use inukshuks. Right? So all you see is horizon. It's hard to pick out where you're, you can end up walking in circles because all you see is horizon. But if you pick out like a tall hill and you build an inukshuk on there, now you know where you're going. You have, you have a target. And then you know the size of the Inukshuk, so now you know the size of surrounding objects and you know the distance, right? As that thing gets bigger, now you're getting closer. So in, in, there's like the most basic Inukshuk is just a stone standing straight up, one single stone standing up on the horizon because it gives you a target to walk towards, right? Um, if one arm is longer than the other, Oh, what is that telling you? Which yeah, and which direction do you want to go in? No, you want to go in the direction of the longest arm, right? Um, if it has a head, if its arms are the same length, and its legs are spread apart, and you see it, what should you do? And, and, and just so you know, like almost every souvenir Inukshuk is built with a head, it's built with arms that are the same length, and it's built with its feet spread apart. But when we see those up north, you turn around and you go away. Because we build those in places where there's war, where people have committed suicide, or where somebody has died a horrible death that leaves a negative energy on the land. We don't want that negative energy going into anybody because then it causes you to go and do harm. We don't want that. So we build an Inukshuk that looks like a person 
to trick that negative energy to stay there. And then it tells Inuit, like, hey, let's not go there, right? And then you come down south, and people put them in their garden, and they're going, we're, we're welcoming Inuit. No, no, you're telling us to stay away, right? Um, and then you go through Toronto. I don't know if anybody has seen the Inukshuks that are at, at the airport in Toronto. Yeah, they're horrible. Have you seen them? I don't think so. There's one doing this. <laughs> yeah, well, we don't do that. <laughs> um, it looks like it's like hailing a taxi cab or something. And then the other two that are there are both like war happened there. Like they're telling us to stay away. So um, we're trying to get them to change it. There's a brew house out in Edmonton that's using a, an Inukshuk like that now too. We're trying to get them to change it. Like, um, How many of you have seen the boot company called Kamek? K-A-M-I-K, they have an Inukshuk as their logo, and death. <laughs> the Inukshuk is death, right? And, and then Kamek means one boot. <laughs> o- only one boot, right? If you wanted to say two boots, guess what you need to do? Put another I in there and have it say Kamek, right? That's a pair of boots. So they like misused our word, misused the Inukshuk, and, and yeah, this is what we do, right? Um, so what else? Um, anyway, we don't believe that history is linear. We believe that history is cyclical. So like it just repeats itself. What happened a hundred years ago? What, what were we just getting over a hundred years ago? A pandemic. What were we just getting over a hundred years before that? A pandemic. What do you think we're going to go through in a hundred years? A pandemic, right? History just repeats itself. And the only thing he, we as human beings have ever learned from history is that we don't learn from history, right? <laughs> We've tr- been trying. Our, our historians have been trying to tell people. Right? It just keeps repeating. It just keeps repeating, and they don't believe us. So, because we believe that like history is cyclical, you also get to live more than one life. And we believe in reincarnation, right? So, my daughter is my dad in a new body. We believe that your spirit or your soul or like whatever you want to call that thing that makes you you, we believe that it's attached to your name. So my dad passed away in the year 2000 and his name was Sam. And then my daughter was born in the year 2004 and I named her Sam, right? So like if we're, if we're driving in the car and it's just me and Damien and he's like, hey dad, I want like A and W. And like the closest A and W is 20 minutes out of the way. Where are we going? Uh, going home. <laughs> <laughs> or wherever our destination is, right? But if uh, like if Sam's in the car and like she goes, hey dad, like I want Timmy's and Timmy's is half an hour out of our way. Guess where we're going? <laughs> and we're going to Timmy's, right? And, and guess what? They, they know it. And it's just the way it is, right? Um, Luckily, I don't have to listen to my sister like she's my granddad. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, Inuit women get tattooed, right? And they get tattooed on their, on their face in one place. So they get V-lines tattooed on their forehead. And that's because we believe that once we pass away, uh, that's where our spirit travels through. So we're like pointing the direction. They get lines and or dots on the cheek to represent the kudlik, the stone oil lamp, which was a tool without which we never would have survived the north. We don't need it today because we have electricity and we have heating, right? Um, So now at the beginning of like ceremonies, we tend to light it as a ceremonial thing, but it's not. Its intended purpose was just survival, right? It was our only source of fire in the wintertime. And we, were, we burned animal fat that was processed into oil. Um, then they get chin stripes. And so the first chin stripe you would get when you went from being a girl to being a woman. And then each additional chin stripe was added when you went through a different life event, right? And so as a young girl, 
you'd want to become friends with somebody who had lots of chin stripes because they had a lot of knowledge, right? They'd been through a lot and survived, so you wanted to learn from them, and it was written right there on their face. Then women get tattoos on their fingers. We have a goddess up north that in English they call Sedna. She's the goddess of sea mammals. She was trying to pull herself into a kayak, and then her dad cut off all of her fingers. And as each digit hit the ocean, it turned into a new sea mammal. And so Inuit women pay respect and homage to Sedna by getting their fingers tattooed. Um, then they get their forearms tattooed, and the forearm tattoos are to us what family trees are to you guys. So if you could read and understand the tattoo, then you knew her history and where she'd come from. Who does the tattooing? Family, family, like in a traditional community, it would have been older family members who knew the history, right? Um, and each line, like each meant a boy or a girl, and they would, if somebody died, it would get crossed out. Like it was updated. Um, so pretty, pretty cool, right? Um, and then this next one absolutely blew my mind when I found out the reason for it. So Inuit women get beautiful tattoos done on their upper thighs, right? They kind of look like the forearm tattoos and they're just a lot bigger and they cover the whole upper thigh. And, and they do that so that when they give birth and their baby opens their eyes, the baby has something beautiful to look at. And, and to me, that just says a lot about our culture and, and, and the way we think about our children. Because, like, think about the amount of pain, the amount of forethought, too, that had to go into something like that just to make sure that the moment they opened their eyes, they didn't have something bland to, to look at, right? I think that's absolutely spectacular to, to do that for somebody you've never even met before, right? Um, so yeah, then Inuit men got pierced. We didn't get tattooed. You're like, really? <laughs> um, yeah, so I'm pierced to look like a walrus on purpose, right? Um, and I actually have like walrus tusks. So I can unscrew the, the metal balls that I have here in, in my piercings. And then I can exchange them and I can put in my walrus tusks. Um, they're pretty heavy though, so I don't wear them all the time. You can go around and show them that. Because they're two inches long and they're carved from real walrus tusk. So after, after a few hours of wearing them, they start to pull on my lips and... Now, traditionally, they wouldn't have been carved so intricately, intricately. They would have just cut slits here when we were younger, and they would have embedded ivory inside those slits. Like, think of the, 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 the ones who have the lip, the lip circle. It's kind of the same deal, but down here instead of just the, just the lip. Um, yeah. <laughs> but then think about it. If 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 you're Cree, if you're Northern Cree, and you have fifty of your party, and you come up north to steal things from us, and you're looking across the tundra, and you see fifty dudes all with walrus tusks embedded in their lips, are you gonna continue? <laughs> so it was like, so we're superstitious hunters. So we thought that if we looked like walrus, we'd have an easier time hunting walrus. But it's also like intimidation factor. It's proving like, like strength and yeah, right. So yeah, do you guys have any questions that you'd like to ask about Eni or about the Arctic? I've thrown a whole lot of information your way. I have a whole lot more. Um, but if you have questions, then I can sort of like gear it the way you guys want it. And he talked about the history of the Inuit people. So could you go over that? Just like, before, like why they were just, or why they were forced to, because um, 
who were nomads from what I understood from that presentation many years ago. Um, and then, of course, they, they want to cut off, the government wanted to cut off your source of food. Could you talk about that? So, in, on the planet today, yeah. who are Inuit most closely related to? Any guesses? Yeah. Mongolians. I, Inuit came from Central Asia. I, like Growing up, Canada wasn't ready for Inuit, right? And down south. So growing up, my sister would tell people that she was Asian. And they left her alone. I told people I was Inuit and I got teased relentlessly, right? because just people weren't, weren't ready. But th that's why we can pass as, as Asian, because we are, <laughs> right? But Canada has said we're indigenous because we've been in northern North America for well over, over tens of thousands of years. We came across when there was an ice bridge. We followed the animals. And then when we wanted to go back, that ice bridge had melted, leaving us. That's why we're in... Canada, America, Russia, and Denmark, because we're on the ice, right? And then the Europeans come over, and the very first community ever founded in northern Canada is actually considered my hometown of Nain Nunatsiavut, and it was founded in 1771 by the Moravian missionaries who came over from Germany, right? Um, and so when, 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 when Harper read his apology and didn't believe a single word he was saying, um, Labrador wasn't included. All of our residential schools in Labrador weren't included in that first apology because then Harper said, well, Canada didn't have a hand in those ones because Newfoundland and Labrador didn't join Canada until 1949, and those residential schools had already existed. So then Trudeau becomes prime minister, and he goes to Labrador and reads a separate apology for our residential schools. Um, so my dad went to one of them. Now, I'm old enough that I could have went to residential schools. When did the last residential school close in Canada? What year should I have graduated high school? 1996, right? Um, but luckily I was living in Ontario and the last one in Ontario closed in 1974. So I didn't have to, right? But I'm still affected by them. My dad was a, my dad was a linguist. You know what a linguist is? He knew all nine dialects of Inuktitut in Canada. He helped to write one of the first ever Inuktitut to English dictionaries. He taught it at Memorial University. I visited 40 years after he left, and they were still using his material. 40 years later, right? When I went to Nain for the first time, somebody brought me into the government building and showed me his work. Like, he, they're still using his stuff. Um, and, and then he, like, moved to Ottawa to work for the Department of Indian and Northern Affairs for 20 years on preserving the language. Guess how many words he taught me? Zero. Nothing. I didn't learn any of my culture from my own dad. I didn't start learning about my Inuit heritage until I was 20 and had moved out of my house. I grew up Dutch. Yeah, I, don't, I know I don't look it. My mom's from the Netherlands. Yeah, my mom's from Den Haag. I, I mean, I've got the Dutch tongue. I've been to Scheveningen, I've been to Maduradam, I've been to Germany too. I went with my high school band. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, dollar a beer. Thank you very much. <laughs> 16 years old, that wasn't a good mix. 
<laughs> they just kind of set us free in Germany. <laughs> no, um, that's a whole other story, though. Um, but yeah, I, I, I didn't learn anything from my own dad. And, and when I was a teenager, I, I asked him why. And he must have been ready for the question because he didn't have to think about it. And he looked me right in the eyes and he said, my son, I wanted to raise you guys westernized so that you could succeed down south. That was the goal of residential schools. Take the Indian out of the child. They took it from my dad. They took it so bad from him that he didn't want his own kids to learn it. Right? You know what the kicker is? I didn't become a successful person until what? Until I, no, not my language, until I learned my culture. I still don't know the language, but now I know the culture, right? Um, I've been teaching the culture in schools in Ottawa for the last eight years, as of last week. Um, really? Yeah. Damn. Yeah, right? So, I mean, it's, it's pretty, I mean, I count my lucky stars every single day. Uh, I'm, I'm a lifelong southern urban Inuk who was raised without my culture, and now I get to teach it. Right? My daughter is a professional throat singer. So when Justin Trudeau became prime minister for the first time, he had two little throat singers come and perform at his swearing in ceremony. One of them was my daughter. Right? Um, and then they performed when he won again the second time. And then they didn't get an invite back a third time. I don't know why. <laughs> but it's pretty cool when the prime minister sees your daughter and drops everything that he's doing and goes to her. She doesn't, she doesn't have to go to him. He goes to her. And, and I think that's pretty cool. One time they were at an event at Wabano and Sophie was there, his, his wife. And, and they did their, everything was like by the minute scheduled because like she's the prime minister's wife. Um, and so they had like only five minutes to perform and like it had to be right down to the second. And, and, and then they were done and Sophie's like, no, no, we're stopping everything. And I'm taking a selfie <laughs> with, with these two girls. And, and, and like the, her, her handler was like, like, <laughs> oh, like we got it. And she's like, no, no, I'm taking a selfie with these two girls and that's that. So it's pretty cool that that, that family like, it's like that, right? Um, so you guys want to try some games? There, there's many reasons to play Inuit games, but there are like three main reasons. What's the like number one reason to play any game in the world? Yeah, right? We're people too. We like to have fun, right? And then a long time ago, were there grocery stores? So how do people get their food? Well, we had to go and hunt. So we have games that practice or mimic hunting skills. Teach a child how to play a game that uses a hunting skill, and you just set them free. <laughs> and, and they already know how to do it, right? Um, like my kids have been cooking since they were five. Here's a stove. Put your hand over it. Feel how hot that is? Yeah, don't touch but this is how you use it properly, right? They've been doing their own laundry for a decade. I haven't touched my kids' laundry in 10 years. Life's great. <laughs> right? As soon as they could reach the bottom of the washing machine, you know how to operate a smartphone? You, you go and operate that machine over there. Even if we had to jump up and reach down? You got a belly. <laughs> All right? And then if they don't clean their clothes, well, it's natural consequences, right? Um, that's like, I've never, I, what's the one rule I have for you? Just tell you where I'm going. That's it. But I have expectations. I don't have rules. I have expectations. Guess what? My kids can't lie to me, <laughs> right? It's, it's awesome. But it, it, we raise our children differently. Where was I going with this? I have no idea, but back to games. I have, se I have severe ADHD, so I just had a squirrel moment there, and I have no idea what I was talking about. 
Pardon? Uh, oh yeah, hunting and teaching. Oh yeah, kids hunting. Games. Yeah, so you teach a kid a game at a young age, and then you set them free. Um, and then the last reason for Inuit games, whew, <laughs> um, Inuit lived in small family groups, like of about sixty people. That was your city. Your parents, your siblings, your cousins, your aunties, your uncles, your grandparents. That's who you lived with. So could you find a husband or a wife in your own group? Well, not likely. Right, so at least once a year, Inuit from different areas would all meet up in one centralized location, and then it was a chance for the men and the women to play games that proved how fast, strong, and tough they were to try and attract a husband or a wife from a different group. So reason number one for Inuit games was to have fun. Reason number two is to practice hunting skills, and reason number three was just to show off. <laughs> I wonder if they would go inland or closer to the edge well, well i mean we are coastal people but here, here's the thing we're coastal people right we have 53 communities in canada 52 of them are along the coast we don't swim <laughs> too cold and so it's funny i go i go and work for the military right in the summertime they have their basic military qualifications and they do cultural camps now five of them across canada so I go and I work them, and we usually like go camping by a lake. And when it comes time to free time, all the First Nations and Métis, they just rush the water. All the Inuit, we just sit back on the beach, and we're like, those guys are crazy, eh? <laughs> and we're like, yeah. And then you look back out in the water, and you can see them. They're going, those guys are crazy, eh? <laughs> and we just, we're, we, we don't mind going on top of the water in a boat. But to get us in the water, I don't know, right? Yeah, like we live, we, we lived in a neighborhood with a pool. They never went once. <laughs> we would always look at it, say, we're going to go next time. Yeah, no. Um, and so, yeah, so let's show them the game. Which one? Uh, well, we brought these, so we might as well show them these. Um, so the most famous games, like if you YouTube Arctic Winter Games, the most famous games are the high kicks, and these are high kick stands. Um, and so Damien is going to demonstrate. So the first one he's going to demonstrate is called the... Oh, wait a little. Yeah, I'll wait. No, 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 that's good. So when you're walking around, just be mindful of the expensive microphone in the middle of the floor. Um, so the first one that Damien's going to demonstrate is called the one foot high kick. Now, he's going to have to jump using both of his feet. Then while he's in the air, he kicks the target with one single foot. And the foot that he kicks the target with is the only foot that he's allowed to land on. And that's why it's called the one foot high kick, because the one foot does it all. So that's the one foot. Now the world record for that is up there. Not nine, nine feet, seven inches is the world record for the one foot high kick. I don't know if like you play basketball. No. <laughs> Do you watch basketball? Little? You know that orange basketball rim? Yeah. That's 10 feet. Yeah. So somebody kicked five inches yeah. below that rim and then landed on a single foot. And during the competition, you have to hop three times to show the judges that you have control o over your body. Oh, you got the height, you just missed the target. And during the competition, like our Olympics is the Arctic Winter Games, during the competition, just like the high jump, just like the long jump, you have three faults. You can miss twice and then get it the third time and still move on to the next, to the next height. Then there's the two foot high kick. To notice the target comes down lower. The movement for this one is easier to do but the height is harder to get because now you have to keep both your feet together the entire time. 
The world record for that one is nine feet. The guy who broke it did a reverse pike. So I don't know if you've watched diving. Yeah, a pike position, you bring your upper body down. A reverse pike, he brought his legs up and like practically kissed his knee. Yeah. Then there's the Alaskan high kick. Now this one's kind of counterintuitive, but you start on the ground. Makes no sense. <laughs> now you take your strong hand and you put that on the ground behind you. You take your other hand, you grab the bottom of the opposite foot. Now you stand on your one remaining foot and then you jump, kick and land without ever letting go. And you can't land on your body. You can only land on your foot. The world record for this one is seven feet. A buddy who did it did a one hand handstand, transferred up onto his fingertips then lightly tapped the target with his toe and then came down. Incre incredible, incredible. Is there footage of that? Or? I think there might be. I don't know. There is footage of all of these games, like the, 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 the professionals doing it. I mean, this is impressive, but like the professionals doing it, it's, it's insane. Then there's the one hand reach. Um, I'm a little sore, so I don't think I'm going to do it today. But the one hand reach, you got to balance your whole entire body on one hand. And then you reach up and touch the target with your other hand. And then that hand needs to go back down on the ground before any other part of your body touches the ground again. Are you going to try it? It's, 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 it's tough. So you got to take your elbow and you jab it right inside that hip bone and then you kind of turn into it and that's the one hand reach that's the first time he's done it hey. that feels good eh i feel like it could took me 10 years to do that to figure out how to do it because i didn't have anybody teach me i had to watch and look and then try and figure it out and i didn't want to try it all the time so it took me 10 years to figure out how to do it and now my belly gets in the way a little first ever time being able to actually complete the one hand reach. Does anybody want to come and try any of those? <laughs> hey, come on. <laughs> Which one do you want to try? I don't know. Uh, we'll get we'll get you we'll get you doing the one foot. Okay. So this is how I teach people how to do the one foot. It's a lot harder at first, but it helps to get your brain around what that leg needs to do. So come here. Instead of jumping with two feet the first time, stand on one. Now, with that one foot that you're standing on, I want you to jump in the air, kick the ball, and land on that foot without this one doing anything. Yeah, get closer. There. Now, now you know what that leg needs to do. Now you can jump with both feet, kick it with that one, land on that one. We were thinking about what I have to do, yeah. No, you gotta jump. What you did there was you reached and then, and jumped. then jumped. What yeah. you gotta do first is jump and then kick. There. Yeah. <laughs> right? Now the two foot. Two foot, okay. Just keep your feet together. And you can bend your knees outwards. You don't have to keep your feet, you don't have to keep your legs like flat. Yeah. Okay. Can I try a bit higher, just for the, for the fun of it? <laughs> now, here's the thing. With these kicks, you want to start lower because you could land flat on your back. Yeah. <laughs> and so what we do is you start low and then you work your way up. There you go. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Here, try that. I tried it before try, years ago. Try that. Yeah. Can I, can I kind of... Yeah, you can take as many steps as you... Like the professionals, it's like the high jump. They run, and then they jump. I usually take about three to four steps. There you go. Nicely done. Then there's... This one's pretty special. Up, 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 right there. Come No, up. Right there. Come here. We don't do this one very often. But it's called the two-person high kick. Oh, back up. 
You ready? One, two, three, go. That's cool. The professionals basically they go neck to neck. Yeah. All right, here's a fun one. Jump over the stick. Pretty easy, right? <laughs> How do we make it harder? <laughs> we make you kick the stick backwards as you're jumping over it and you can't land on it. And then the next person would go and they would try and kick it back even further. Oh, that was tough. Does um, anybody here think they're flexible enough for this game? Oh, wow. <laughs> so, all right, I'm gonna try. I'm gonna try. Maybe. I think I'm gonna twist myself. <laughs> Make sure your hands are facing upwards. It's impossible to do this with your hands facing down. Step over the stick. <laughs> he makes it look easy. Go backwards behind me and touch my nose as low to the ground on the stick as I can and get back up without falling. So these are all games that help with your agility, your like just different explosion actions, right? Well, there's another one. So we like to go ice fishing. What's the difference with ice fishing up north and ice fishing down here? So the, ice the, is much the ice is thicker, the ice is thicker. also the, the body of moving. water is different. So water? It's ocean. The water keeps moving. Ocean doesn't stop. So the ice doesn't stop. When you're ice fishing, even on a solid piece of ice, you're moving. And then sometimes that ice crashes into land or that ice crashes into other ice and what happens to the ice that's around you? It starts to break. So if you're down kneeling on the ice, ice fishing, and the ice around you starts to break, where do you need to go? To more solid ice. And how fast you need to get there. <laughs> so we practice jumping from our knees to our feet, because you ice fish in this position. Okay. No, like you're jigging. The jig's oh. right below you, right? Because you're staring down into the water, and you're watching what your jig is doing. Then that's frozen ocean water. The char aren't biting like they normally do. You don't, you don't need you don't need bait. You just need a lure. And the fish doesn't even need to bite. You just need to have that fish swim over your hook. You don't care where you hook that fish. You hook it in the tail and bring it out of the water. Still the same as hooking you here and bringing it out of the water. So that's why you watch your lure. And then you can catch that fish. So you gotta lean forward over the hole. So that's why we don't go up on our tippy toes. Because if you're up on your tippy toes and you're doing the same thing, it's so much more uncomfortable. So we use the flats of our feet and then for the game, you're not allowed to build momentum. You're not allowed to lift your bum off of your feet because you're in the sitting position and you need to jump. Now going straight up is pretty easy and how do you judge who wins? It's impossible. So we add a degree of difficulty by making you jump as far forward as you can go before landing on your feet. The woman's world record for this one is four feet seven inches. Here. And the men's world record is six feet. That's way too much. They were almost like eight feet. <laughs> you're five. You're five six, and then you reach. That's another two feet. Really? Yeah. Huh. I didn't think I'd that many. But three. Well, you don't. Well, but from toe to ear, you do. 
So from your knees, you're allowed to swing your arms. For the game, you're allowed to swing your arms. You just can't lift that bum off of your ankles. You can also lean backwards to And then you launch yourself. Wow. Oh, I messed up. It's also harder on the floor than it is on that. Yeah. And that has gone Not the front. <laughs> we have a baseball game. <laughs> Take, take all the rules of baseball and like throw them out the window. <laughs> and then you have the nooptitude rules of baseball. I don't even know why we call it a nooptitude baseball. Because that's like calling it English baseball or like German baseball. You use the language. I don't know why. But it's called a nooptitude baseball. So traditionally, a long time ago, before we had baseball bats, um, we had the bone from a walrus's penis that we used as the bat. <laughs> and you don't hold it with two hands, you hold it with one. So there's already, there's already one baseball rule out the window, <laughs> right? And then there's no strikes, there's no fouls, there's no balls. They just throw the ball until you hit it. And, and as long as you make contact with the ball, you, you run. So like you can hit the ball backwards if you want. And, and we run. But we don't run to first, then second, then third, then home. You run to third, first, second, second, first, third, then home. So you go the other way. Right? And like in regular baseball, if somebody in front of you is running and they're a lot slower than you, you have to run at their speed. In, in our baseball, you just pass them. Um, in regular baseball, you can only have one person on the base at a time. In our baseball, like sit there and hang out if you want. You can have a tea, whatever. Just chill out. You can have ten people on the base if you want, no problem. Um, in regular baseball, there's nine innings. In nooptitude baseball, there's one. Um, so it's not three outs and you switch. You got to get the whole entire team out. So it's like, like, so you come up and you get out and you need to line up somewhere else. But then you hit a home run and she gets to join back in the batting line. So like there's a nooky two baseball games that go on for five days. <laughs> like people go home and take a nap and then they join back in the batting line. They go home and eat and then they join back in the batting line. Like they go on for, because there's no night, right? The sun just keeps shining. So they just keep playing. Normally we grease these up, but like nobody wants to go back to school with greasy hands. It's still hard just as it is. So why don't you like come up and grab the other half of that stick with you. Right now you have to stand side by side. Yeah. You have to keep that foot next to his foot. You can't move that foot. Now you need to take the stick away from him. Want to count this down? One, two, three, go. You can see how if it's greased up, it's a lot. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right? The game ends in like... We've got three of them, so everybody come up and try. Each game kind of has its own sort of purpose, right? To help with, with hunting skills. Um, the finger pull. <laughs> we, we have games that hurt. <laughs> because like part of part of being Inuit, like being nomads and relying on animals and not grocery stores, even if I'm in a little bit of pain, like I still need to provide, right? So like, <laughs> sit, like <laughs> sit like me, sit like me, but opposite. Opposite. So yeah, put this on my on my knee. Yep. Now this hand comes here on my shoulder. Now this is, I'm, I'm the seal. So I'm gonna put my elbow 
right against my hip, then I'm leaning on it. Leaning, I did the same? No, no, in your middle finger. Just you know, just your middle finger like this. Come a little closer. Now your job, you're the hunter. You have just shot, shot the seal. You've ran to the hole. You've thrown your arm down the seal's breathing hole. You've put your hand in the seal's mouth and you've grabbed onto its cheek. Now you need to pull it out of the ocean. Have fun. <laughs> Good job. Yeah. Oh, that's so cool. Oh. To battle. Yeah. We're hungry. We're hungry. Oh. 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 I saw it yesterday. <laughs> I did that with a bunch of high schoolers and they like, got to prove themselves. So I'm like, yeah. really sorry from yesterday. But, and that's what would happen, right? Because the seal. Like, right? Yeah. So then you're pulling, you're pulling, you're pulling, and all of a sudden, right? It comes out. But that's that's why we play that we play that game. It's to practice pulling that seal. I don't know. How's your finger? <laughs> and what you'll notice in a little bit is that finger will be warmer than the rest of your finger. Yeah. It's not gonna hurt. It's just gonna feel warmer than the rest of your finger. Yeah. That's yeah. just because of the blood rushing to Great. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so like um, we also had one like Inuit had arranged marriages, right? But but like in life things happen. And, and and sometimes you'd fall in love with somebody else. Well now that person who's arranged and the non arranged person have a problem. So they get up in front of the entire community and they grab their drum. Oh, and they grab and they drum dance and they sing a song that makes fun of the other person and their family. <laughs> Inuit originated rap battles well over ten thousand years ago. I thought it was this one. Then it is. Then then they would grab their drum and do the same thing. Now we're like extra mad at each other, right? So now I grab the soft part of my fist. Yeah. Right? And I charge at him and I hit him right here. And he has to stand there and take it. Yeah, yeah. And, and then I come back here and he does his. And then I do mine and then he does his. Until one of three things happens. One person could quit, which rarely happened because that would bring shame. Right? Two, and you're like knocked out, can't continue. Three, you are literally punching somebody in the temple. Death occurred. If we both survived, guess what we go and do? We go hunt, we go hunt together. So we just stood up in front of our communities and broke the bond that we had. It's not good for survival. So what do we need to do? We need to go and reaffirm that bond. If we go out on the land and, and I kill him, guess what? More than likely, I'm dead too. Because I'm now in the Arctic by myself, so I'm not going to hurt him, I'm not going to kill him. Because there goes my life too. So now that reaffirms the bond that we just broke, right? It's pretty, it's pretty cool. It's, um, even today, we have a different justice system up north, in, in Nunavut especially. So like down here, you, you really love caribou liver. It's like your favorite thing in the world. She's got one, really nice one, just sitting right there. You snuck into her igloo, you take it. What do we do here for a theft under? A little court, maybe throw you in jail for three months, make you think about what you did. Then we set you free. But we give you a title of ex-convict. Now you go and apply for a job, and you go and apply for a job. Her application has ex-convict, yours doesn't. Who's getting the job? So now what do you need to do to survive? You need to become a better criminal. What kind of a justice system creates better criminals? Right? So instead up north, what we do is we sit you down. Like, why would you do that? You're like, oh, caribou liver is my favorite, but like my husband can't like butcher 
to get a caribou liver. So I wanted one. And then, like she had one. So you know what we do? We take your husband. We stick him with the best butcher in our community. And we teach him how to harvest the caribou liver. And guess what he does with the first one he gets? Guess what you never have her have to do ever again? Yeah, because now he can go and get it for you. It right? needs to make for them. Restorative justice. Yes. Right? It's all, it all comes through. Well, yeah, you make fun of people. <laughs> you do something wrong, like we just make fun of you for doing it. <laughs> and then you don't do it again. The way we right? show each other that we love each other is just by teasing. It's part of our culture to tease people. It's just the way that we that we do it, right? Like you don't know how to you don't know how to braid your hair. Well, we're gonna tease you till you do it properly. And if you're walking in the same path as another woman, and you have the messier braids, guess who moves? No. Messier braids, <laughs> because they didn't take the time, they didn't have the patience to do it, so now they have to do the more work. I tried to get a team from Ottawa into the Arctic Winter Games, and they're like, yeah, no. <laughs> yeah, you have to live over a certain parallel to join. But like, Ottawa has the largest population of Inuit outside the north, so I figured I'd try. There is movement, though, on, you know how, like, school boards do, like, track and field, board-wide track and field? Well, in Ottawa, what we want to do is record youth teaching the games. Then we want to send that out to gym teachers so that I don't have to waste all of my time doing Inuit games presentations and I can do more of the cultural presentations. The gym teachers can teach the students the games. And then once a year, all the different schools come and compete in traditional we had one school board, the Renfrew County Catholic District School Board. Yeah. They got me to go around to five different schools and teach five, oh no, more than five. It was ten, ooh, yeah, it was ten schools. And they got me to teach five different games. And one of their gym, board-wide gym representatives followed me around to all the ten different schools so that he learned the games ten different times. And then, for months, he went around to the same schools and redid the games. Redid the, so the kids got to practice them. And then in the springtime, we met at one of their outdoor facilities. And they had, we, we bought five of us, one to judge each game. And they had students from the 10 different schools bust to the outdoor facility and they spent the whole entire day competing in, in Inuit games and at the end of the day they were awarded medals. Oh. Hit my they were they were awarded medals and everything else for traditional games. So it's pretty pretty cool for a school board to, to do that. Yeah. Now we're learning how to make drums and just this summer I built a twelve foot long steam box. So now I can steam wood and I can bend wood and I'm just slowly, slowly getting there. Uh, but yeah, it's pretty cool with the different things that are going on. Any other questions? I don't even know what time it is. <laughs> uh, what, what are the diff um, for which uh, hunting a skill is for like, each phase? So like the, 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 the jumps are for like agility. Right, because we hunt on the ocean, and sometimes the ice isn't connected, so you gotta jump. And so, like with agility, right? Uh, like it's the one hand reach was for hunting bird eggs, others are just for strength. Um, almost every single Inuit game activates your core. Most people in the south who have a bad back don't have a bad back, they have a weak core. And if they just worked on their core, then all of their back problems would be solved too. Right? It's the most important muscle group. It's really weird. I walk into a kindergarten class, and, and like I'll, I'll be doing this with grade fives, and they'll be having fun, and then the kindergarten teacher will walk in and see a little bit of what I'm doing, and they'll go, 
you're gonna do that with my kids? Like five-year-old, really? You're gonna do this? And I'm like, yeah, no problem. Kinders are actually one of the best age groups at doing Inuit games because they play, yep. they fall, yep. they get up, they balance. So their cores are amazing. <laughs> Toddlers have amazing cores. Yeah. So they're wonders at, at Inuit games. And it's really weird if you ever like become a kindergarten teacher or something, I call it a kindergarten hack. So you know the, the knee jump? Yeah. Did, I, did we show them when yep. you? Yeah, the knee jump? So I teach kinders how to do that. And at first, none of them understand it. But one kid in a class of 25, if one kid gets it, I stop everybody and I make them watch the kinder do the knee jump. And then the most amazing thing happens. One by one by one by one, they all start to get it. And it's just it's like I could show them until I'm blue in the face and they'll never get it. But once they see a kid their own age do it, then they have the confidence to do it themselves. I call it the kinder hack. And it <laughs> works. It works all the time. I love it, right? And then I teach kindergarten teachers the kinder hack. And they're like, really? And I'm like, yeah, watch this. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty cool. Um, so then others, yeah, it's just, just like, what it does is it isolates body parts. So like the arm pull isolates your arms. So your arm can get better. The leg wrestle isolates your legs. So your legs can get stronger. Um, and then like the finger pull for grabbing the seal's mouth. Um, some of them are just for fun. <laughs> There's another one we have where, where you hang a, a, a bone with a hole from a string. And then you hang another string with a weight from that. And then you have like a group of people all stand around. Today we use chopsticks because they're like the perfect size, but like mini harpoons. And, and so you say go, and, and you have to try and get the harpoon, the first one into the, into the circle. And the reason why you hang the weight from it is because if I just hit this, this is gonna go flying, but if it had a weight here, the weight would counterbalance it and it wouldn't fly as far. And it's such a fun, it's such a fun game to play. We've done it once at the like September barbecue at, at in Kantagi. I made it once. <laughs> the elders had so much fun. Aww. Yeah, we we also eat like fermented walrus, and that's funny watching a bunch of elders eat fermented walrus is the funniest thing. Cause like, <laughs> think of fermented grapes. What's, what's fermented grapes? <laughs> yeah, so they're eating fermented walrus, and like Inuit elders are quiet, like really quiet, and like they don't talk much until they start eating fermented <laughs> walrus. Then they turn into teenagers. And it's the funniest thing. Yeah. So country food, we don't put it on the table. When we eat the animals we hunt, it's on the, on the floor on on cardboard. We don't cook them, we eat them frozen, right? Um, yeah. And at, at Inuit Day, it's like a big grouping of Inuit. We just see a whole bunch of kids surrounding a seal with bloody faces. <laughs> <laughs> with the biggest smile on their faces, too. At our, at, to see. at our daycare, kids are allowed to play with fire, guns, and knives. At daycare. In Ottawa, <laughs> with supervision, of course. <laughs> so we teach our kinders how to light the kudlik, so they get to play with fire. We have, we we have toy guns in our daycare, but we have animals, all pictures of Arctic animals all along the top uh, of the of the room, and so if a child picks up a gun, and they're pointing it anywhere else except for those animals, it gets taken away. Mm -hmm. But if they're using it just to point at those animals, then they go for it, right? Um, and then they get to use a real, actual ulu to cut up their food sometimes. Mm -hmm. It's just the way you, we teach, even today, with guns, we start teaching kids how to hunt at the age of two. Um, I've been playing Inuit games since I was young. 
kids are just little people. So we treat them like little people. I don't know why the West treats their kids like they don't know what they're doing. Right? We treat our kids like, like <laughs> they used to come to me on a Saturday. Hey, Dad, I'm bored. Well, here's some bus fare. And I'll go get lost for six hours and come home. Eight, eight years old. And it's like, go wander Ottawa. Go figure out your city. This is where you live. You need to know it. And, and you need to know how to get around without me. So go have fun. And that's what they, they do. I mean, Ottawa during the summer, he, he's up from midnight to eight. And like, out riding his bike. I don't care. And he's out getting exercise outside. And, and he can't do it during the day because it's 38 degrees with the humidity. But at night it drops down to 22, very little humidity. So he goes and gets his exercise and, and hangs out at parks. And he's not out there stealing or causing problems. So what, what do I care? My best friends used to come over almost every single weekend. We'd leave at like 11 o'clock at night, come back at around mm. noon. Nine o'clock in the morning, and he'd just be fine with it because we were safe. I just had to let him know where we were going, and that's it. Trust your kids, yeah. right? I don't. And they do, and they do amazing things. I don't have to ask if friends can stay over. I don't have to ask if I can go over to a friend's house. I just say, "Hey, Dad, they tell my friends me. are coming over." Kids these days. They always seek permission to do things. So they're scared to go and try new things. So I never wanted my kids to ask me for permission for anything. You want a friend to sleep over? You tell me you want that friend to sleep over and then I can tell you if we're busy or not, right? And now they go places and they assert themselves. They don't need to. Like, they're not scared of authority. They're good with it, right? My daughter takes the new course in, in Ontario. There's a new course called MBE3U. Instead of reading Shakespeare, you learn from indigenous authors. And it's supposed to be a class that, in, that, that celebrates indigenous culture. I go to schools and I teach about the the things that Canada did. I teach the horrors, I teach the atrocities in history, in religion, in social sciences, in plenty of other classes. This one class is supposed to celebrate our culture. So my daughter takes it in grade 11 and the teacher just keeps talking about all the atrocities, residential schools, this and that, talking about colonization. The complete opposite of what this course is supposed to be about. So my daughter writes an email. That email gets sent around to higher ups. And they're like, okay, let's remove that teacher because they're not listening to even us. Then we're gonna put in another teacher. That teacher not teaching the curriculum the right way either. So they remove that teacher. Fourth teacher finally starts teaching it properly. Then the board, the Ontario School, like the Ontario Ministry of Education has a meeting and they're like, this isn't, this isn't right. Why, why, why did this happen? It was the way the curriculum was worded. So they rewrote the curriculum because of my daughter. Um, and I think that's absolutely amazing because when I was in school in the same city, the curriculum on Inuit was one sentence, and it was wrong. <laughs> and every time I tried to correct the teacher, I got sent to the principal's office. And you know, you know what's bad when you're at an event? Or you know, I was at a school. I was at a school in Ottawa, and I'm sitting around the table. And this was when I was still going by my old name. And so a teacher across the table yells out my name, and, and another teacher behind goes, Dion. Dion Metcalf? You guys can have a seat if you want. You don't need to stand. Um, and I went, yeah? Like, who are you? And, and she's like, well, you, you won't know me. 
but my dad was Mr. Foley. And I went, oh no. And she went, yeah. And I went, that's not good. And she went, no, it's not. And she's like, you're a teacher now? And I'm like, yeah. And she's like, my dad's going to flip out. Um, so Mr. Foley was my grade school principal. And this teacher who recognized my name was his daughter who had never, ever met me in her life. But she heard plenty about me. <laughs> Even 30 years later, she remembered my name from all the times her dad mentioned it at the dinner table. Yeah. Oh, it's all good. It's all good. Everything is wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. And then my sister's at an event. And from behind, she hears Heidi Metcalf. And she hadn't gone by Metcalf for a decade because she'd been married and had a new last name. So she turned around and went, yeah, like, who are you? And, she went, and then and the guy went, it's me, Mr. Foley. And my sister went, Mr. Foley, after 30 years, you should not be able to recognize one of your elementary school students <laughs> from behind. And he just looked her right in the eyes and he went, I'll never forget a Metcalf. <laughs> my, my high school guidance counselor at my school at the moment remembers my brother from when he went there because he was also a troublemaker. Good. Not good. <laughs> I had CAS called on me because my kids spend too much time outside. I, I want to Fig, fi figure that one out. Okay. So when, when that worker came to my house and told me that, I was like, you know what? Like, I can yell out my kid's name and like within five minutes, they'll walk in the door because they'll be able to hear me and I'll force them to play video games if that's what you want me to do. And he's like, yeah, no, I'll leave you alone. Because <laughs> like, I told him, it's summertime, there's no school. My kids wake up, they have breakfast, they go outside. They come inside whenever they're hungry or thirsty. When's lunch? I don't know. I don't know when he's hungry. Who knows when he's hungry? He does. Right? So no sit, no, like, we don't do this breakfast at 8, like lunch at noon, dinner. We don't do that. It's when you're hungry, you eat. Right? So, and then they come in when the street lights turn on. And he's like, yeah, okay, I'll leave you alone. Once I actually got the city of Ottawa to repair <laughs> We used to live at this one place, and, and every time it rained, at the edge of our property, in the edge of the road, there was a hole, <laughs> and, and so a big puddle would form, and this kid would just go and sit in it. <laughs> <laughs> and lie down in it and sit in it and um, I guess one of the neighbors called the city and complained because one day they came and patched it up and then like a week later it rained. First thing this guy does is he opens the door and then he goes, oh, my puddle's gone. <laughs> I guess everybody in the city came and repaired it. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah.